Yes. Waterfalls in Oregon. Okay, let me. Uh, All right. Okay. Looks like um, looks like we're we're all here. I want to uh, welcome everybody for um, our. This is the second in our series on uh, life everlasting. We have. I'll allow you to introduce yourselves in just a moment. We have um, representatives from Volunteer Hospice, and uh, everybody's like, I guess I'll shift it over that way away from you. Um, we we are we are recording um, and available on Zoom. Sometimes we have people that join us, but oftentimes we have people that come back later on and watch the video that's been recorded. So thank you for allowing us to to do that. Thank you for for joining us. Um, I'm Matt Pog. We met by email. I'm the pastor here, so introduce myself. And but if uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can start. I'm Grace Davis. I'm the executive director at Volunteer Hospice. I've been there since only September, so I have joined the amazing leadership and team that is our um, organization. I love that. Um, Ted and Molly, this one. Oh, I'm Ted Ripley. I'm. Uh, a member of the board, a retired attorney in this community for 50 years, and uh, really involved in hospice. Um, I'm Molly Wallace. I've worked with volunteer hospice as an RN since uh, 2015, and I've done anything that a nurse can do there. So everything from management to patient care and everything in between. Molly's amazing. Oh, thank you. And we were going to have Haley here, but unfortunately, she's on call and we're very busy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about how we were going to structure this, and um, we you wanted to have more of kind of just a discussion. And so um, maybe you could start a little bit by, by saying, sharing a little bit with us, like, what's something about hospice you want everybody to know? Um, and, and then we can kind of go from there and see how, yeah. how it goes. Yeah. So afterwards, we'll actually uh, leave you with a set of slides. Um, we're also going to give you some, you know, just a one pager about advanced directives as well. But the slides, the reason I bring that up now is that it also gives a historical perspective of volunteer hospice. Um, so volunteer hospice has been around since 1978 because of Rose Crop, who many of you may know. I have no. Um, Rose is interesting because her force of personality is incredible, right? So 1974, hospice as a concept came to the United States. It was, it was a concept from the Middle Ages, kind of disappeared when uh, the medical system came in and said, uh, you know, our goal is to cure, right? Not to ease through death, right? So that disappeared after the Middle Ages. It kind of resurfaced in Europe in the 50s and 60s. And then in 1974, it came to the United States to Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. And Rose, in 1978, four years later, in Little Clown County, said, we're going to have a hospice here. That is incredible, right? Wow. She was a visionary. And she made it happen here. So that's what is the birth of our organization. And her force of will kept it going for numerous years. We are an organization that is uh, running currently on a budget of 1.7 million. We have paid staff, even though we're called volunteer, we have paid RNs, we have paid CNAs, and we have a mission support team. The majority of our budget goes towards um, uh, salaries and wages um, because it's not to run a medical organization. Um, and we need to be competitive so that we have the top quality staff that we have. Um, and the majority of that $1.7 million budget comes through community giving. So you guys are the reason that we survive and thank you for that. The other thing that I need to point out is that there's probably 23 or 2,500 um, Medicare billing hospices in this country now. There are maybe four or five like us. We remain innovative because Rose went with her son, Patrick Crum, who um, is an attorney in Seattle, and uh, Derek Kilmer, who was at the time a um, state legislator, not a federal legislator, and carved out a specific RCW just for us, just for us. We have an exception, so we do not have to bill Medicare, we do not have to bill Medicaid, we do not bill private insurance. 
but we provide all of our services free, whether it's hospice, palliative care, or uh, lending uh, or bereavement um, support and spiritual support. Um, and we do that at a cost, whereas Medicare hospices can bill up to $31,000 per patient. We are, if you take our expense line and just divide by our cost, um, we do this for about five to seven thousand dollars per patient. So very different area. Cost savings, but also what it means is that the patient can continue to get all of the other services they get. Um, they keep their primary care physician, they keep their oral occupational therapist, they keep home health, they go to the pharmacist for their PCP orders. We just come alongside. We come right next to the patient and we help with the comfort and pain management in the last stages. It also gives us the freedom to say, oh, you have more than six months to live? That's okay. If you qualify for our services, we'll still give you those services. We're not like Medicare saying you must have a six months or less diagnosis. We're also able to, as a consequence, say, you want to continue curative treatment? Absolutely. Continue curative treatment because that's okay. If that's what you choose, that's what you get to do. Very different from the Medicare process, right? So we're kind of, as Molly always says, the unicorns of hospice. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a, I know you didn't expect all that. That's, that's a nutshell. <clears throat> we're special. We yeah, have people. Tell you. <laughs> they're people. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you going on. <laughs> so, from uh, a legal standpoint, because Volunteer hospice doesn't bill anybody. We don't have to follow the rules. I mean, when I was in private practice, the number of physicians who were stopping practice because two thirds of their time was doing the things in order to get paid. We don't have any of that in our organization. So it, it, it really is a liberating thing in, in the whole program. And so Instead of a billings department, we have a donations department. Yeah. <laughs> All volunteers. <laughs> Oh, that's another thing. We have 168 active volunteers as of last month, and we always need more. Whether it's on the board or in in uh, bereavement support or respite support or you know any number running the the lending closet deliveries, uh, front desk, all of that is volunteers. Special thanks. About 2,000 hours of volunteer hours a month. Past. Sounds revolutionary. It's incredible. Yeah. We're so lucky. This is Cloud County, and we have it. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have had to deal, um, either in your immediate family or you know, with cl close loved one, uh, with hospice care wherever? Any of you have already? Okay. Any of you at volunteer hospice with volunteer hospice? Hopefully, we we helpful in the care. So one of the things that that um, I'm personally curious about is like uh, the various, I, I think of advanced directives, but I think there are other terms like living wills and things like that. What are some of the things that um, we all should know about and, and have prepared so that when, when we face, you know, those kinds of issues about our care and whether to go to like palliative care and so on, that we can provide for our loved ones, you know, instructions. I, I have to admit, my wife and I have talked about this so many times, and we, you know, we kind of go back and forth, and we, it just feels like this huge hurdle that we can never quite get over. It's not that we're afraid to, to document all that kind of stuff. It's just that it seems kind of daunting. Um, so maybe you can speak a little bit to, to that for us. Oh, James, start, and then I'll just pass to you. Okay. So I'm just going to give you some definitions and stuff. I, we will leave you with the board. Okay. So advanced directives are legal documents that allow you to spell out ahead of time what types of medical care you would want if you become unable to speak for yourself. Bottom line, you can't speak for yourself. The document is helping to deliver the care that you wish to have delivered in the way that you wish to have it done. If you prepare your documents right, if you can't speak up, these documents will speak up for you. That makes sense. Um, so, to the point of different kinds, right? There's healthcare proxy, durable power of attorney for healthcare. There's living wills. There's DNRs, do not resuscitate, do not intubate. Um, and there's something called a post. Um, 
These are all different kinds. So there's all different flavors mm -hmm. of advanced directives. Um, and it depends on the individual. And these are the experts that can speak more to that. Well, and yeah, there's, there are different legal documents, but also within those documents are various choices. And in my experience in working with clients, it's really important that you talk, you talk with your family, your spouse, your loved ones about what your personal desires are. I mean, I had a friend who's, whose mother was in a nursing home, fly down and see her several times a year. She didn't recognize me. And her, from my viewpoint, her quality of life is why why keep it going? But in that family, that was important. And so it's really important to do those sorts of things, have those sorts of conversations so that whatever documents you prepare or have prepared, they really reflect what how you want to handle it. Uh, I um so, a uh, long time ago, I had a 12-year-old son who died of cancer. It really caused a lot of thought about quality of life. He spent the last month of his life which he was working. He had three surgeries. Now, because he was 12, we wouldn't do that. But my wife and I discussed, you know, when we get older, we don't want to go through that. And that's again a personal choice. So sorry for the diversion. No, no, no. I so my perspective is less the, the legalities of it and more how it affects the family because that's what I see in the home. And it is so valuable to share with your loved ones what you want, how you want to be cared for. And it's, I'm not saying it's easy because no one wants to talk about their own death, how it's going to affect their families, even though inevitably, in reality, we all know we're going to die. You know, like that's, it's easy for me to talk about because I see it every day in my work. But I do understand that for a lot of people, it's really uncomfortable. But when you go through those conversations with your family, it is such a gift because I see families that have everything planned out. There is absolutely no question. The family members that are left behind, there is no doubt that they're doing exactly what their loved one wanted. But when I see the people that, no, 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 no. I, and I'm not saying that if you have those conversations, it means you want to die. And I think that that's the big difference that people are like, if I have that conversation, that means I'm going to die. No, it doesn't. It means that inevitably we're all going to die and we should talk about it and we should say those things because when you don't, seeing those families flounder and oh my gosh, what would they have wanted? Am I doing things right for them? It's absolutely heartbreaking, you know? And so you have to think about it like, yes, this may be uncomfortable. Yes, this may be really difficult. But what a gift to everybody who loves me that they know that they're doing what I want. It. So that's my perspective, less of the legal. But the legal is really important because that's where I defer to people like this when people come to me and say, I really want to have these conversations, but I'm not, there's so many different documents. And what do we do and how do we do it? Then I knock on the head door and say, Can you help, please? Because the big one that the nurses look for, it's called the POLST, P-O-L-S-T, Physicians Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And it's the green form that people put on their refrigerator. And it's super simple. The top section is, okay, super simple, meaning there's not a lot of boxes, but like the hardest decisions you'll ever have to make in your life. So that's not really fair to say simple. Um, but the first section literally just says, if I stop breathing and my heart stops beating, is to keep me alive. Then the next option is selective treatment. So that could be, yeah, I will go to the hospital. Let's say that I need some fluids to make me feel better or a blood transfusion 
to give me that little pep in my steps so that I can make it to my daughter's graduation. I mean, those are little things that, that you can do. And then the last choice is comfort care. And I think people see that and they have this preconceived notion that they're gonna go into the hospital. And if you have, do not resuscitate comfort care that they're gonna say, oh, well, get out of here. And that is not the case. Comfort care is still care. You can have oxygen, you can have comfort medications, you can have comfort care is still care. It's just a different brand of care, you know? So that's the form that we see the most as the nurses in the home and because it's an actual doctor's order. You fill it out, your doctor signs it, and let's say that you call 911 because you've fallen and um, you don't want to be resuscitated. But, you know, your family member calls like, oh my goodness, I think they broke their hip. But by the time the paramedics get there, you stop breathing. If they don't see that green form signed by a doctor that says, I do not want CPR, they have to do CPR. So that's why it was so, so, so important because I have taken care of people that did not want to be resuscitated and were and lived through it. And it was absolutely horrible because they wake up and they're like, hey, what am I doing here? I am not supposed to be here. The, the one that was most heartbreaking for me um, I worked in an inpatient hospice, which is like a hospital, but just for hospice patients. And this man had lost his wife years, years, years ago. And he was so ready to be with her, so ready. And he went to the hospital that he didn't normally go to. He went into cardiac arrest. They didn't have his pulse form and they brought him back. And he came to our unit, chest like destroyed, ribs cracked and all of this pain. And he just said, I cheated. I'm supposed to be with my wife right now. Here I am in this bed. Oh, so it's, that's just an example of why it's so important to have these maybe unpleasant conversations. Before I get a, a little stuck on that pulse thing, because mm -hmm. what if something's going on, whatever it is, and I'm likely to survive it, I'm likely to come out of mm -hmm. it, like I need extreme care for a little while, but mm -hmm. then I'm probably going to be okay. If I have the pulse and I say don't intend into that, you know, don't do any of that stuff, then I might die when I could have come through it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be stuck in you know, like if it's something if I'm not coming back in any kind of good form. Then how do you manage that? That's a good question. Christy's um, a nurse with us. So I, I just want to tell you guys, I work with these ladies. I work at hospice now, but I also was an ER nurse for 22 years. And the pulse form is very important. It's important for the medics. With, with my late husband was a paramedic. And um, so, so it's important for the medics in the field to see that because that's going to guide them. But the hospital will also take your pulse form and they'll scan it. So if you land in the ER and you don't happen to you know, have the pulse or maybe the medics didn't see the pulse, if it's been scanned into the computer, they will look for it there and that'll give them some guidelines. But in answer to your question, you can write in more, you can write in about, you know, your quality, uh, if quality of life, you want full measures, as long as you're going to hopefully have some quality of life. In other words, if you've got like severe brain damage and you're never going to wake up, probably you don't want to be, you know, continued. Some of you might know Robin. Um, she was um, my sister-in-law that went to this church and uh, Robin ended up on a ventilator at least five times. And every time she would come off of the ventilator, she'd say, oh, I, don't, I never want to do that again. And the nurse would go in there with the pulse form and, and, and talk to her about changing it. Like, you don't want to be resuscitated. And she'd say, oh, well, but I don't want to die. So she could <laughs> never make herself a no code. Never, never, never. So then what it, it, it fell on us. So the last time she was in the hospital, um, she was just there for a respiratory infection. She wasn't even in ICU. She was on um, a medical floor and she had a heart attack. And so there she ended up on the ventilator again, but this time she just didn't wake up. And, and they can only keep that ET tube in your throat for maybe a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and it can erode the, the esophagus. So they have to do the trach. And they won't keep you here in this hospital. You have to go over to a special respiratory hospital in Seattle. So we were at that point with, with Robin, was like she could 
She could go over there and stay on a ventilator for who knows how long they could keep her alive on that ventilator, um, have a trach and stay in that hospital indefinitely, and maybe never wake up. It, there's there's people over there that have been on a ventilator for like 10 years or something with brain injuries and whatnot. So, so as family, we made the decision after giving, you know, she had almost two weeks in which to wake up um, on her own and she didn't. So, so that at that point, even though she was a full club, they'd done everything. Um, we as family said, go ahead and take her off the bat. She lived still for another three days after that. And then she, she did die. So you, you can put on that pulse form, um, you know, that like being like, you don't want to, you know, you'll stay on the ventilator as long as there's hope or like within two weeks, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have the trach, you don't want to go that far. So you can kind of set, you can write in some limitations there. Mm -hmm. Now, that reminds me, I, a long time ago, I represented the United Airlines pilot. And he had a substantial amount of money. And in his form, he said, if I'm under 60, keep me alive for 60 days. If I'm over under 70, keep me alive for 30 days. If I'm over 70, let me go. I mean, that was written in the this one. But hopefully you can answer what those limits are going to be. And actually, Ted, that's a question that I kind of have for you because, like I said, as a nurse in the home, I'm most familiar with the green pulse form a lot of little spaces to put in extra stuff. I've seen people write in on the side because they talk about um, feeding tubes, right? That's another option that they talk about on the back. And some people will put in there willing to trial a feeding tube for 14 days. Mm -hmm. Or I've seen next to the CPR, no CPR and full treatment, people write kind of off to the side, um, willing to be intubated for one week. If um, it does not look like I'm gonna come out of this, then I would like to be a DMR. So you can put those things in there, but I don't know that the forms is the most appropriate form to do that on. No, I think that there are, there are other forms. Another, another form is a durable power, a power of attorney for healthcare decisions. And that is the person who makes healthcare decisions that you can't communicate. And there's some really important things about that. That could be very customized also. But when you select the person, it's very important that you have conversations with them and they share your values regarding life. Because if you point your oldest daughter because she's the one that should do it and she believes you should be kept alive forever and you're and she's not ready to let you transition. And your belief is, I've had a full life. I've been very lucky. I'm very fortunate, but I'm ready to transition. So you wouldn't want her to be in that position because if you can't communicate, she's the one that's going to talk to the doctors. Yeah. And even though ethically and legally she's supposed to do what you want, She's the one communicating for sure. And it's not just the family member. You need to also make sure that your medical team also supports the decision. You need to have conversations like Christy, Molly, and, and Ted are saying is so critically important. You need to be open and having conversations with everyone about your choices and make sure that your team of support, whether they're your family or your physician, support the decisions you're putting down because there can be overrides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that was a big help for me when I took that pulse form to my doctor to sign it. He went through each level and he said, what? You don't want to be resuscitated? And he said, let's talk about this. And so he explained ramifications of each one of those that was super helpful because I didn't know all the things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So do you mind if I ask who your doctor is? Mark Redland. Oh, what? Dang it. He's now he's a hospital. I know. <laughs> because I, that's so wonderful. Mark is that he took wonderful. that time I still to do that. that. Yeah, because yeah. I don't think, I think it's getting better, but I still don't think that every physician is comfortable. Now. Well, they shouldn't just sign it there. I agree. Okay. <laughs> I agree. No, it, it needs to be a discussion because yeah. 
have to go <coughs> into the doctor's office and fill them out with your doctor. But if you're on hospice, you're homebound, me is your hospice nurse can go in there and assist you in filling out the form and then you sign it and we can deliver it to your physician for you. So in that case, we're responsible for having that conversation, um, which I have conversation. So I respect when doctors who are under these constraints, you can only have a visit for 15 minutes and churn and burn, get them out. No, we're talking about life and death here. Take the time to have this conversation. So that's awesome that he did that. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple things there. Uh, first of all, to have that conversation, you need to set up the appointment in a way mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to do that. Because you can't just go in there on a, an appointment to set for 15 minutes and throw their whole day off trying to have that right. discussion. Yeah. Uh, secondly, though, the uh, concern that I have had on occasion is I've had three different positions now yeah. because I have I had one and he, he retired and then his son took over and then he retired or uh, moved elsewhere and then had another position and she retired mm -hmm. and now the position that took over for her is moving elsewhere and I'm getting another position. Yeah. So it's a huge problem. Consistency it is the key here. Absolutely. And so when you've had that discussion with your physician, every time you have a new position, I think it's worth checking to see that what you've discussed with previous physician is on the books. And even if it is, to maybe review it again with this new physician because you're older. Mm -hmm. This physician may have other insights that you may not have considered before. And so to go ahead and go through that again, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Thank you for saying that. That's really important. And as a practitioner, you know, if I'm reading your chart, that's very different than you looking me in the face and telling me what you want. That's right. going to stick oh, with yeah. you a lot more than it just being on paper. Yeah. So, a, 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 a written word doesn't convey the same message mm -hmm. as one that has been discussed. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Mm -hmm. if, if a person was to um, contact your organization, do you have a list of attorneys that are local that? person can go to? Well, that's a good question because I'm, I'm, I'm retired, so I don't practice law, but I'm just in the process of working with the staff to develop that sort of a list to be able, so many of the, some of the hospice patients need to have the attorney come to the house and actually sign documents there. A lot of attorneys aren't willing to do that. So I put out a notice to the Bar Association just last week, because this was a new idea, and I've gotten some responses, and so that's something that I hope that we'll be able to develop. Give us a couple months. <laughs> it's also interesting that just in the short conversation you had um, of all the things that you could add, um, you know, um, if it's less than 70 years old, mm -hmm. it seems that there, if you have a list of all those options that you can choose, or is that just developed on an individual basis? Does that, that make sense? sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think in my experience, it's been on a more individual basis. Yeah, I think it's on an individual yeah. basis. And I mean, when I was when I was practicing, I had developed my own forms. For instance, in my healthcare file of attorney, uh, I had a paragraph, I call it a sort of a standard paragraph that says, my agent has the authority to check me out against physician's orders. <clears throat> Because if I have a client who is willing to consider death with dignity and they get flown to a Catholic hospital, their choices may be limited because the staff, the hospital rules may say, our doctors can't even discuss this with the patients. So and under those circumstances, it's important the agent can say, okay, I'm checking out. Of 
Sorry to pick on the Catholics. Are you guys all aware of Death with Dignity and Volunteers Stop Eating and Drinking? So Washington State has codified Death with Dignity, which is a weird term. It's medical assistance in dying. So if you have a terminal diagnosis of six months or less to live, you can speak with your physician and ask for medicines that you can take um, to yeah. speed up the, the dying process. So the medicines are taken and you, you die naturally within you know, a period, short period of time. Um, that is codified by Washington State law. There is also volunteer stop eating and drinking, which is not codified not in the legal system in any state in the United States. That is a choice that an individual can make that I choose to stop eating and drinking. Um, some physicians support it, some do not. If you do VSED, volunteer stop eating and drinking VSED, um, it is not considered suicide. So what's on the death certificate is the diagnosis that led to that, that uh, terminal state. That's not good to know. It is not suicide. Okay, so that does not kick in in terms of insurance and all of the other things, right? But it is a sticky wicket. It is very tough for some people to say that, you know, they're going to assist with that. And then where volunteer hospice stands is that we support a patient in care, comfort, and pain management care, all the way up to the dying process. We support families post the dying process and the bereavement. We do not deliver the drugs that assist them. We do not support any discussion about it. We refer to End of Life Washington, which provides all of the information for a patient to make their choices and decisions. So is it considered suicide when the person opts for the death? death with dignity is not suicide either. Okay. The, the diagnosis on the death certificate is a diagnosis that led, that was the terminal illness. Yeah. And that, that was one of the things that I talked about when I did seminars when I was practicing and trying to get, and I, I made the marketing error when I was at a very, uh, a conservative church west of town. And I spoke about this as a choice. I didn't get any clients for that. <laughs> I think it is important to consider that. Uh, I had a good friend who utilized that. Her husband died of cancer. She was bedridden. Her pastor was there. Her family was there. Friends were not. And then there was a, a service in the church later on. So anyway, you know, in the White House, tough choices. So can the family make, I'm sorry, was somebody else go ahead? Right? It just says that you can change or revoke your directives at any time. How would you go about doing that? Well, do you for, just redo the form? You can, well, you can actually form. tear it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can you can do that. You can do a formal revocation, um, and sometimes this is a challenge. Is people who go in and out of legal capacity, and they say, "Oh well," oh. when when they when they don't know what's going on, sometimes they get upset with what their agent is doing, and then they gain capacity, and then they destroy it, and then. If you don't have that document, I'm particularly thinking of a case for the financial power of attorney. And so he revoked his agent under the financial power of attorney, became incompetent again. And then the court had to appoint a guardianship and guardian, and you know, it was a real sinkhole of money, but that happens sometimes. Yeah. Yes, you can just replace. And depending on the document, right? You yeah. need legal signatures and you need to. So you just get your doctor's signature on the on the pulse yeah. form. Yeah, we redo pulse forms all the time. And it seems like yeah, people's medical situations change absolutely from month to month sometimes. Right? Absolutely. So you might say, no, things are different now. I want them to be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I redid a pulse form with somebody on Friday that just it said, I want everything. And I walked in and she looked at me and said, I do not. I am exhausted. I'm not getting out of bed. I have no quality of life. And she was ready to redo her form at, at that point in time. 
Where do we get the points? Well, if for a pulse form, the green form, if we bring them to the home, but not everybody's on hospice. So I think oh, any well, doctor's appointment, doctor's yeah, doctor's yeah, you can just go in at a doctor's appointment and say, like you said, I would like to set up an appointment to discuss my pulse form. Mm -hmm. So I have an example forms of everything on here, and I'm not recommending it, but I got them all off the web. Yeah. yeah. I literally searched on the terminology and could find sample Good. forms that you can fill up. I don't recommend that. Have conversations <laughs> with people who have expertise <laughs> <laughs> to well, fill it out properly. Yeah. Yeah. So I have the recommendation that a form on the internet is better than no form at all. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So is Bridge Builders uh, involved with any of the patients that you worked with? We definitely have in the past, but hearing you say that made me go, oh my gosh, I haven't heard of any of our patients having Bridge Builders involved. Mm -hmm. There is someone, um, uh, <laughs> So what, I'm sorry, what, what is Bridge Builders? Just a, yeah. It's basically... Well, okay. Bridge know, Builders uh, is a group over in Squim that will take on uh, wards of the board mm -hmm. to do their power of attorney or guardianships and so forth. So it's like when your family can't serve as that power of attorney, right. they are the... Like, they, the they take hey, that, they no, take that they on and, and, and they're... <laughs> I, I, my daughter is under them now. I, I, was, oh. I was her guardian for several years and um, got to the point where there were going to be things ha happening in my life that I couldn't mm -hmm. continue that. And so we made the arrangements to transfer it over to them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so they're now uh, her, her uh, power of attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she started out as a dark ship, but is now just a, a power of attorney. There's a woman who's, I can't remember her last name for the life of me, I'm so sorry, but her first name is Penny. Sanders. Sanders, thank you. Mm -hmm. She has tons of hospice experience and it can be hired as an individual to uh -huh. do what Bridge Builders does. And man, she is a bulldog. Oh, if you want someone who's gonna advocate for you, then yeah. your guy. So we, yeah. we have had at least three patients at first recently. And when I do see people who it's a very difficult situation, she does not shy away from that. I, I love having her involved. So there, there are options. Like there are people who don't have any family. That's yeah. usually where we see bridge builders involved right. um, in, in situations like that. So does an MD have to sign the pulse or can it be a nurse practitioner? It can be a nurse practitioner or a PA. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you look on the thing, there's a lot of things in terms of, you know, common errors. One of the key things is not signed. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Not signed is a critical error. <laughs> okay. And, and it's such a small thing. And you think, ah, oh, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Just hmm. curiosity, does there ever have any kind of like a, you know, like a one-stop workshop or something like that where you know you, we can lead a conversation like this go find forms and then go you know like we could like if we had a you know a, a doctor an attorney or somebody people right right there that you know you could bring it in have have a brief discussion sign everything so you know you're kind of good to go and answer questions Is that ever like a one-stop yeah. <laughs> i would love that if you want to put that together we'll be there so so here's the counter thought to that right i would think that a physician should know the patient before signing their pulse honestly right mm -hmm. so one physician for anybody who walks in the door is, is a little tough to ask for because if the physician doesn't know the case should they really be signing probably not Right. Or or everything else that needs signed, though, I yeah. suppose, or notarized or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that, that yeah. is the caveat. But a workshop where you could get everything in order and then you could go to your own physician or mm -hmm. you know, finalize it, that might be a reasonable mm -hmm. thing. And that is something that I will definitely take back. Yeah, yeah. We'll put it on the calendar well, here. Yeah. Considering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and That's a great idea. Yeah. For instance, the power of attorneys and the healthcare documents, they don't need to be 
uh, witnessed by a lawyer. Some of them need to be notarized. Some of them just need to be witnessed. So if there was a workshop where people could work through their own individual decisions and somebody pointed and helped them and understand the things that it's important for them to consider, I think that could be a working path. Uh, pro bono attorneys has had different kinds of workshops. I'd be a quick project with those guys. They're mm -hmm. good guys. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Another mm -hmm. nonprofit. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, this kind of goes back to my question about when your position will change. Yeah. Yes. Does the signature of one position who's no longer there oh. still stand up? That's a really good question. No, it would have been killed. It does change. Well, because you might not have the same position, you know, might be somewhere else and have a different condition in the hospital. It's not going to be the same position. It's still, it's still legally binding. Is, is, is there a, a time frame that it would still be binding, and, but then afterward, you know, like, I'm not aware of a time frame. Because if, okay. if my position is moving out of the area, oh, obviously they are. <laughs> Well, what, what if they, they die? die? Or, or even if they don't exist. <laughs> no, it's, what, it's, what's still that? A, it's still a legal document. Right. It's yeah, dated it's, when it's signed and it's good uh, until you make a new one. You know, yeah. you get a new one that yeah. I think has he, a newer date on it. Okay. Then you get rid of the old one. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. uh, if but there's but no the, expiration date. But the that. key thing to remember is your your attending physician at the time of choice may not agree. <laughs> and mm -hmm. has yeah. medical ability to override. So that right. is a key thing uh -huh. to think about as well, right? Yeah. So if yeah. it is the attending physician is the one that signed, you know that they're on board, mm -hmm. right? right? If they're not the ones that signed, they may or mm -hmm. may not be on board and they may or may not have the ability to override. Which right? circles back to your really mm -hmm. good point before that every new physician, you need to have that conversation again and again and again. And you may get sick of it, but it's really important to do. Yeah. One other addition at, at the hospital here, they would be happy to scan those documents so they have them in their records. Right. So uh, that's really, and, and it's really, I was frustrated because of their policy because I, I did a lot of customization and I had a client who was taking emergency room. He didn't have this thing there and said, oh, well, fill out this form. They had him fill out a two paragraph on that we both what he did. He had made changes. I mean, it, it was just very frustrating. But it's better to have them on file recorded. And, and that's the thing. Um, the medical systems around here, not us, but um, known OMC, even Jamestown, I think, use Epic. So it, it could yeah, be right. shareable across yeah. that. And Epic yeah. is used by a lot of health systems, not just in this area. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, ours is a little less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you're out of town, you know, on vacation or something, if something happens, yeah, it's yeah. still presumably. I don't know how the yeah. one it kind of depends on where you're at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. For one thing, yeah, that's why you need that power of attorney that right. they can contact and say this happened. Mm -hmm. What are the wishes? Well, that was my question: Is wouldn't the power of attorney have the ability to override the physician? If you had a new physician who didn't share ethically, I guess, with the choices made in the original. Uh, the, the healthcare power of attorney would have that decision making because that's, that's your voice when you can't yeah. speak yeah. on your yeah. own behalf. Exactly. That's a good I wanted to bring something up. I'm oh, sorry. No, I had been there before for 40 years. If we did not have that health care power of attorney, I'm not sure what I would have done because my wife, uh, because of some stuff that was going on, in her life, she could not make those kind of decisions. Um, and that was just so important to have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no matter how young you are, yeah. you should have these documents. Yeah. I have them. I'm 43. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm also a hospice nurse, so my perspective <laughs> is a little bit different. I wanted to, I brought up the customization. Um, I was a hospice nurse in Illinois for a short period of time, and they had this form, and I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's like a little pamphlet, and it's called the five wishes. 
and it's legal and like a legal document in some states. I don't think that because I've never heard of it talked about here, it. but it, I've never heard of it being used as your advance directive in a hospital mm -hmm. like they did in Illinois. Um, but if you could look that up online and print out the five wishes, it really helps you think about all of the things, like all of the things that says, if this were the situation, what would you want? And then there are like a bunch of lines and you can put as much information in there as you want. So even though you might not be able to use the five wishes document as a legal document, what a great rough draft to personalize your advanced directive. So that, that would be a good thing to have if you did want to personalize things. I used to, uh, before coming here, I was in Iowa, and I, it seems to me I remember, I remember that. But so I don't, so people that have um, maybe like a vacation home or something like that in another state, they should have the same kinds of documents in other, wherever else they might find themselves. Is that? Well, legally, the documents should be recognized in every state, but some states have, uh, well, for instance, Washington has the uh, the death with dignity law that right. is <laughs> universal in all the states. Yeah. Oh. So people yeah. might be mindful though of, of if they spend time yeah. in other places. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Well, then around here, a lot of people are going to Canada. Yes. That's a different. When, when totally I first, different. When I was country. Really, a <laughs> young, young attorney, uh, a woman came in, and that was. <laughs> That was in the days of Dr. Kevorkian. You know? Yeah. And she said, because she was from Holland, she, if I have an issue, I find the Holland. It's legal mm -hmm. Yeah. Our country, in my view, isn't always as advanced in the medical area as some other places in the world, yeah. both in treatment and in adoption. I would just dawned on like the death with dignity thing. And don't, I'm not planning to see, but I was just, I wonder if this has ever happened. Where, like, let's say that you live in Washington, a legal state, and you, your family lives in a state where it is not legal, but you want to be with your family and you take those medications. What if you get the meds in Washington and take them somewhere else? You what happens? Be, you could be violating the law. If you pay attention to the news, there are prosecutors around this country that are enforcing their view of what's right and wrong. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, totally it, it seems like it could be a federal offense, though, too. Right? Yeah. But who does it go with? The person has passed away. So what are you going to do to them? Does it go back on the doctor? Will the doctor prescribe them in the state where it was legal? This is totally off base. Yeah, but just yeah. sort of somebody yeah. trapped the connect to the Right. And that's yeah. probably what the violation would be. Yeah. yeah. So I heard that the VA will not pay for end of life medication. No one will pay for end of life medication. It, you pay for it out of pocket and it is not that's cheap. expensive. Like how much? Um, <laughs> well, I've heard everywhere from $800 to $2,000. Mm -hmm. And when I first started with Volunteer Hospice in 2015, they used a different uh, medication. It was called Sicanol. And he would get, uh, you know, a bottle of pills. They were capsules, 100 of them. And you have to empty the powder out of every capsule and put it in there. Oh. I, I never did it, but I got would get there after the fact and see the remnants. Like, oh, my gosh. That's the legal system. Legal medical is not every pharmacy. You have to have a oh, special yeah. kind of pharmacy, and so they've got the. I think there are two or three in the state of Washington, so they control the market. Jim's so, with what? So there's a place in Canada. Is it that that gives time for the person to rethink? Well, no. That so that medication, the Sicanol. Everyone I saw that took that, they would drink the medication, and they would be passed away within an hour. Oh, I mean, it was okay. very fast. Oh, wow. okay. Within yeah. an hour, sometimes That's minutes. Huh. And then, this is what I've heard, maybe you can um, provide a different perspective. Sicanol is used in the, used to be used in the concoction that they would give people in the United States for the death penalty. Yes, and European countries do not support the death penalty. And they're the manufacturers of Sicanol. So they will not give us Sicanol anymore. <laughs> so now what it is, is it's a liquid like base and then a concoction of 
like really high doses of morphine and lorazepam and maybe um, like an anti-seizure medication. And you mix them together and you have to drink it. Nobody else, someone else can mix the meds, do everything for you, but you have to be the one that picks up that cup and drinks the medication. And that, that has, that formulation has had to be tweaked quite a bit because when they made that switch, people were complaining that it was really burning. And so the death with dignity volunteers, that this is the beautiful thing. End of life Washington volunteer that can be with you to prepare the meds, to make sure you're taking them correctly, because it's not just, oh, we take these meds. They have you take an anti-anxiety pill 20 minutes before, a beta blocker 15 minutes before, an anti-nausea pill 10 minutes before. So it's this whole process, which can be really intimidating if you're not, uh, if you're not, not comfortable medically, you know, with, or good at following directions, because not everybody is. So you're just because your hospice nurse can't be there, doesn't mean that you're alone. So they will have this, this volunteer with you that can do all of those things, except take the meds, but not to scare anyone. I think that they have really honed it in and now the new formulation is a lot better, but it was, it's tricky because it is not federally legal and from state to I, state. I'm sorry, I'm getting snagged on the stark irony that there are some states that you cannot take your own life, but they're more than happy to to end your life if you're on death row. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, just this, you know, the idea that the Europeans won't give us the medication to assist in end of life decisions because we'll use it institutionally. Yeah. Isn't that wild? So you said it's that frustrating. Here is supports the before and the after. So after somebody in your family has died, how does hospice support? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. Mm -hmm. um, so when someone passes away, like in the immediate, you don't call 911. There's absolutely no med car that comes. It's your hospice nurse that you know, that you trust, that you formed a relationship with, which I think is so stinking valuable to have that person come instead of, you know, a cop. Like that's intimidating. So the hospice nurse comes. We will listen to the heart and make sure there's no heartbeat. We contact the funeral home and stay with the family until the funeral home arrives to support them through that. Then I believe within two weeks, our grief and bereavement department mm -hmm. takes over and we start contacting the bereaved once a month for 13 months just to touch base. Wow. How are you doing? Do you need to talk? We also have group bereavement. We have individual one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we have all of these options and it doesn't even have to be um, a volunteer hospice patient that's passed. You could, it could be your sister who died when you were five and you're still grieving that. You can come to volunteer hospice and get our grief and bereavement services for free. And then also when you visit on a time of death where you might bathe the body. Oh you know, gosh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a number of things that and that's up to you, that's just so you know. That's what I love to tell people. There is no right or wrong. You know, when I come in, I think you get so overburdened with decision-making and you're consumed with grief. It's hard to make decisions. So sometimes when I come in and I say, okay, would you like me to bathe them? Do you have a special outfit that they wanted to wear? I'm blowing their minds and they're like, oh, one more decision. You know, so weirdly, that's another probably conversation that you should have when you're talking about end of life. And again, there is no right or wrong. There's sometimes when I come in and the family's like, no, don't touch them. They have been through enough. They're free. Leave them alone. And that's fine. That's your decision. And then some people, when I give them that option, they feel guilty. Like, oh no, or if I don't bathe them, but then if I it, you know, and oh, I didn't have a special outfit picked out. Who cares? That's okay. <laughs> you know, and it, it's it's yeah. so individualized and personal. There truly is no right or wrong. Also, um, I do some of the bereavement calling for a volunteer hospice. There are times that uh, families or individuals who are going through hospice. Uh, we'll call and ask if somebody can talk about spiritual kinds of things. They might not have a pastor. Uh, and then I have been called a number of times with that, and others are also. Mm -hmm. um, 
it is interesting though that 13 months that's up to the family the bereaved family um not everyone wants calls mm -hmm. and what's interesting to me is that men especially whose wives have died often do not want calls mm -hmm. uh, it's harder for men to receive calls than, mm -hmm. than but not all i have now what i'm working with it's been a long time it's a man so it, it varies mm -hmm. okay we, you know why yeah and I believe we have two different types of grief support groups. There's one where you where you have to have been in the in a, a series oh, first actually. before you go into the uh it's a drop to use mm -hmm. drop in piece. Mm -hmm. And there's somewhere you don't have to have had any previous grief support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot. Ask your graphic to those, manages all that. If you are interested in more information on that mm -hmm. level, let me know. So I get that. we're interested in a great support group, we would call Astrid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She came yeah. and talked to the deacons and said that we had things like death cafes and yes, Astrid, Astrid is the person. So she would help you find the right group for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> we even have groups for people that have lost pets. I don't know that they're as common, but I've heard that we have them. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I don't think we currently have one, but I think that is you know, a conversation that Astrid was recently bringing up. As a I want to be in that group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we've got a couple minutes, probably time for one more, one more question or closing comments or anything. So I have a question. Does that medication for end of life, does that expire or? Yes. So I think. The last, and the reason I know that is because we had a patient who was Johnny on the spot, and the second he got his prescription, he got it filled, and then he was doing so great that he didn't take it, and didn't take it, it had been a year and a half, and I had to do some research because he was like, Has this expired? I didn't know, so I had to call End of Life Washington, and they said, yes, it does, which is such a shame because it's so expensive. So then he had to go through the process and get it again, but they did tell me, and the, the guidelines were six months, nine months, and I'm, I can't remember which one it was, but I think the prescription is good, so you don't have to fill it, but that prescription is good for six months. Mm -hmm. And then once you get the medications in the home, as long as you don't mix them together, they're good for nine months. The other thing to consider is that when you go in to talk to the physician about death with dignity, one of the first parameters that they do is a mental health assessment. Right. Yeah. So for people who have dementia, this is not an option. Right? Right. Right. It's really, right. You don't have the mental capacity to make any decision. So those that have early signs of dementia, certain indicators in their genetic pool, whatever, sometimes do repair early, but then you know it, it drives on for a period, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's parameters, right? It can be difficult. All the more reason to do it now. To get the directives out. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I guess I would also say though, there are theological questions about that. Absolutely. And I would definitely refer to the pastor Absolutely. about some of those kinds of issues. Yeah. Yes. And what kind of supports do you people have working in this field? You need for self-care? For yourself. Oh, the nurses need self-care. <laughs> <laughs> We support each other really well. I feel like after, so we do something in the every morning when we work. Um, we get on a like a Zoom call. And we call it the huddle. <clears throat> and a couple of weeks ago, I had an awful visit. Like just crushed my soul because this person was so didn't want to die, and she was dying. And it was like watching, um, like watching a toddler sob but it was a grown woman and watching her family struggle with how do we deal with this? And I was, you know, there for hours getting things ironed out and then, you know, you're human. So then I doubted myself, did I do the right thing? Did I support them in the right way? And so the next morning we spent, I don't know if you were there for that huddle, but maybe 15 to 30 minutes, just letting me talk about it and supporting me and, and that, enabled me to go about my day. 
you know, knowing like this is, I, I always, I had this weird realization one day when I was driving down the street in Port Angeles and I'm looking at these different houses. It's like someone died here, someone died there, someone's grieving there. And it was like, oh my, it washed <laughs> over me. Like, I know the secret that not everybody knows. And it, it's so nice to have our little, this is gonna sound so weird, but our little deaf community where we can talk about those things, it's vital is supporting each other. And I get more food massages. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking your time this morning. This has really been, been yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, if you get any kind of the one-stop thing workshop. worked out, or, you know, yeah. let us know. What a cool idea. Yeah, um, yeah I'm sure you, you would kind of affirm it too, but I, I, you know, we've been with families that have been grieving um you know at the time of death as well and the, the families that are prepared night and day from those who are struggling to understand you know so the more you can <clears throat> i say this kind of hypocritically because we've never crossed that hurdle my you know my wife and i to get everything you know even though we've talked about it to get everything codified but you know it, as, as much as you can do that and keep that up to date i think i encourage you to do that so i'll also though put in a plug for next week because we'll continue to talk about grieving itself next week yep. and something that we tend not to want to talk about at all mm -hmm. oh, yeah. thank you so i'm going to leave this with you we talked a little bit of history about volunteer hospice but also goes into each of these different types of things in a little bit more detail I will send you the slide deck as well and the one pager as well. So. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Bye. Bye.